put our trust in you, Father God. We thank you that because you are the everlasting God, that, Father God, you know the beginning, you know the end, Father God, you, you know exactly where we are, Father God, as your church. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that we can come into your presence knowing this, knowing this truth, Father God. And Lord, we can just offer up our sacrifices, Father God, our praise. We walk you into this place, Lord. Amen. Just let us know who you are so we can say welcome to you. We'd be grateful. Welcome. Can you thank you? Welcome. 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 Anyone else? Welcome. Just hold your hand as long as it takes. Oh yeah, another one. Welcome. Until the ushers hand you something. We just want to be able to keep in touch with you and also let you know that after the service, there's free coffee, yes, and cake. What is that joke about it being calorie free? It's not calorie free diet. Okay, go left and you'll be, there's a little guest area and we want you to stop and meet some of our leaders and we're going to give you some coffee and some cake. And uh, two things I wanted to mention, two, two quick announcements. One is that next week, okay, here's the thing, two weeks, we're going to have the Every Nation Campus Conference right here in Rosebank. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, I'll be there. Campus is trying to raise some funds to sponsor that event. We just want you to know, next Sunday, we gave them permission to wash cars in the parking lot during the service, okay? So when you come in, if you bring your 50 Rand note, you can both support Every Nation Campus Ministry and you can get your car washed. So will you, will you remember that and try to remember to bring 50 Rand and support that ministry? I wanted to mention one last thing. Uh, in the first service, we had the executive director of Every Nation, Vintook, uh, with us. And somebody said, you know, I don't even know if the church knows we have an African Havens now in Bintook. And so anyway, we just, we just wanted to let you know, African Havens, the social outreach arm of our church, is expanding. There is an African Havens in Bintook, and there is an African Havens in Botswana as well. And you know, all glory to God, but I think it is part of the calling of this church to be apostolic, to be extending, to helping other people do the things that we've learned how to do here. Uh, one, okay, I think that's all the announcements I need to do. Jesse, come up here, because we need uh, you know, a brief offering talk. Welcome. Yeah. Sanguinana, Zabuna, 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 thinking about, you know, what do you share about offering, you know, do you rebuke people, do you encourage people, there's a couple of routes that you could go, but I just wanted to share a little bit actually from my own story and just how faithfully tithing for me has been such an evidence of God's blessing, I mean, in so many ways, and it's something that we don't often wrap our minds around, you know, that you're asking me to give and that's going to bless me, like that equation doesn't quite make sense, Lord. And yet, and yet, when we give to God so faithfully, it is just the elimination of worry in life. It is incredible what God does to liberate your heart and your soul from the chains that the world tries to put on you in that way. But still, I feel like God is calling me to not just faithfully give, because now he's saying to me, Jess, I need your money to be my money, because I gave it to you. (laughs) And I need you to steward it as I would. And I'm still not there yet. We still argue about stuff like that. But I I see that God is not after the 10% of my money. He doesn't need 10% of my money. He needs a heart that is worshiping him and him alone. And so that is what he is after. And this morning, as we consider what we're giving, it is not about letting go of a few hundred rand. It's not about saying, okay, Lord, because you are so faithful, I will do this little bit. It's about, Lord, I don't want to serve any God except you. And so I will not only give of my time, I will give of my offering, I will give to the needy, I will look after the poor and the orphan and the widow. I will live a life that is not about me, that is a blessing to you. And in Matthew 6, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food. 
and the body more than clothing. And I want to encourage us this morning to not just do this as a moment, but to really go home and reflect upon, am I living with God as my one and only? Or do I still need to surrender parts of my heart to Him? Specifically in the area of giving and of money. Amen? We are going to all stand together and do an offering declaration. Highs and offerings today. We declare that you are our Father and your name is worthy of all praise. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask you for provision in our lives today. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We love you, Lord. Amen. I am right there, folks, is an example of how we try and stretch ourselves further and further and further. You know, because that first one, see you next week, see you next I mean, I could do that without a problem. There's no way I'm going to try and do that, right? So, uh, it's going to another level, so praise God for those with voices. Praise God for those that have got to. And I've been trying to get into the worship ministry for about... Uh, I kind of forgot to do the click through it. So guys were like, uh, 
Either they had their own Bibles, which is good to have, or they didn't have the, the words up on the back. So I'm going to get some help this time. But I'm going to read this. And why don't we read this together and just see how Joseph was a prince in process. Genesis 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph and so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord had given him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything that he owned. From that time, he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was in everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. And so Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day after day after day after day, Sunday. 
that's broken our, our, over our lives. Jesus has done this. He has accomplished the victory for us. Communion speaks about a meal that's going to come when we will have this again with Jesus. It gives us hope that our faith is not in vain. So when we partake in communion, let's turn our eyes and focus on Jesus and remember Him as the one who has paid the price for us. And He's the one who made us victory. And He's the one and who our Lord is set on. And that we will spend eternity. I don't know if you think about process the way I think about process. Often when I think about process, I think, ah, that just sounds like such an absolute drag. That just sounds like that unpleasant bit of stuff that we've got to kind of rush through before we get to the good stuff. Just me? Okay. But folks, how many of you know that in God's kingdom, it's not just the end point that's the good stuff. It's all good stuff. You see, Joseph in the pit was good stuff. Joseph in Potiphar's house was good stuff. Joseph with Potiphar's wife was good stuff. Joseph in the prison was good stuff. And ultimately, Joseph in power was good stuff. Because you see, folks, when we consider just this one end point to be the good stuff, the 100,000 points along the way, we tend to ignore and not treat with the same level of respect that God intends us to treat them with as we get to that end point. Cross the side, can I have that remote, please? And I love the way that C.S. Lewis put it. C.S. Lewis, the writer of the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Put it this way, he said, the great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding all the unpleasant things as interruptions of one's own or real life. I love the way C.S. Lewis put this, folks, because so often we can get so kind of distracted and irritated by the, the mundane, by the... The baby's crying again, or, you know, the kids need to be taken to school again. When in fact, what God is saying is, that's part of the real life I've called you into. So use that and live that day by day by day. Joseph pro Joseph's process was punctuated by three key points. Part of his house, part of his wife, and prison. And I'm sure there were many, many more. But the Word of God brings those to the forefront. And let's see what we can learn from that today. And so this morning, I want to look at why process is important. I want to look at what our response to God's process needs to be. And I want to look at what should be reflected in the process in our lives if we're doing it right. And so let's start off this morning and say, why is process important? And the first reason process is important, folks, is because ultimately and primarily it's about Jesus and becoming more like Him. The ultimate objective for each of us, us is not what we can do for Him, but that we might become a soul for your destiny and neither should you. The second thing, friends, is why process is important is because preparation is critical. Before Joseph could lead in the palace, before Joseph could be prime minister of Egypt, Joseph needed, Joseph needed to understand Egyptian culture. Joseph needed to understand Egyptian traditions. Joseph needed to understand Egyptian leadership protocols, Egyptian politics. He needed to understand what those on the ground believed about Pharaoh and his government and where the challenges lay. Joseph needed to learn how to operate in wisdom instead of out of foolishness and arrogance that we saw last week when he shared the dreams long before others needed to hear them. 
He needed to learn a creation where there was no real focus on God, away from his natural father. He needed to learn how to overcome temptation and how to rely on God to make ethical decisions without the need to compromise. Joseph couldn't get that from a book. But Joseph did get that in Potiphar's house. Joseph did get that from Potiphar's wife. And Joseph did get that in prison. Because what better way to learn about Egyptian tradition and Egyptian culture than from Potiphar and in Potiphar's house? What better way to learn to rule over compromising circumstances and yet stay true to God than being faced with the dilemma of Potiphar's wife? What better way to understand where the weaknesses are in Pharaoh's court than hanging out in a prison of political prisoners who are grumbling and upset with Pharaoh and are now paying the price for it? You see, God knew Joseph needed preparation. And what seemed like a whole series of unfortunate events was in fact God preparing Joseph for the ultimate event. God knew what he was doing, right? And God knows what he's doing with us, folks. And sometimes we sit there and we go, God, I just don't get this right now. Lord, why? Just like Joseph would have, I'm sure, at two points along the way. But you see, folks, God sees the whole journey. And God knew what Joseph needed to have in his heart in his spirit, what qualities, what strengths, what spiritual growth he just needed to go through. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purposes. A good friend of ours, Pastor Paul Manwari, he wrote a book and in this book he puts it this way. He summarizes Romans 8, 28 like this. He says, he wastes nothing and he gets you ready. He wastes absolutely nothing, folks. And he gets you ready. And right now, you might be standing there going, God, I just don't see it. Lord, help me. Hold on to Romans 8, 28. Great because he's preparing us for greatness. Amen. Amen. Number three. Number three is coming. All right. Number three, the importance of process. It's because revelation is always partial. Jesus, Lord, we're going there. What's happening here? 
And then eventually, when you eventually end up here, you end up at the end point, you go, oh, Jesus, I see what you did at every point of the way. So what is our response meant to be? Our response to God's process is simply this. Whilst we can look up at the destiny from time to time. And what I mean by purpose is, what has God called you to do today? You see, when Joseph was in the pit, it didn't help him thinking about trying to live over here. It would have been stupid to try and live in rulership, in a palace. When Joseph's in the pit, his purpose was, God, what do I do? Right here, today, in the pit. When he was in Potiphar's house as a slave, his purpose was, God, how can I serve Potiphar to the best of my ability? Lord, show me what your purpose for my life is today. When he was facing the temptation of Potiphar's wife, it's, God, show me your purpose in this situation today. And when he was in the prison, it wasn't, oh my goodness, it was, God, show me your purpose your plan for my life today. Because he couldn't live there. Not yet, anyway. He had to live here. And friends, I think one of the big mistakes we have in the process is we try and tolerate it, we tolerate it, tolerate it at best, but we try and live somewhere else. And God is calling us to live in the moment. God is saying, what is my word for you today? Who is the just one that I want you to touch today? Who is the person that I want you to influence today? What is the situation I want you to change today? Because it's part of my process and preparation for getting you to that end point. But don't try and live there now. Live today. You might be a third year engineering student. You have dreams to own your own construction company. But live as a third year engineering student today. You, you, you might be a waiter in a restaurant. Live as the waiter today yes. and allow God to develop you and plan you so that that dream might come to fruition. You might be the partner of an audit firm today, but you have a dream and a desire to be the Minister of Finance one day. Be the best partner in that audit firm that you can be today so that God can prepare you for where He wants to take you. Amen. Let's give them a hand. best part of it, folks, is this. That as we focus on what we can do, what's meaningful today, as we focus on what differences we can make today, as we focus on the lives that we can touch today, the best part of it is that the destiny takes care of itself. As we live today, God develops it and unfolds it day by day by day. And more importantly, the way I succeed today will be the same way that I succeed when I eventually step into that purpose and that destiny. Yesterday, Kuni and I were out cycling. And I, I, those of you that know me know that I love cycling and I do as much as we can. And in that process of cycling, we passed a young man named Arthur. Arthur's in the middle of that picture there. Arthur, are you here today? Just want to check. No, Arthur's not here, but I know you'll come visit us sometime soon. And as we were going up Krugersdorf Hill, I said, I said, Lord, how do you want to touch and bless Arthur today. Lord, you brought Arthur into our writing group today. We passed him. He joined us. There's a purpose for us. God, what is that purpose? Is Arthur the just one that you want us, Kuni and I, to touch today? Truth is, we had an amazing two hours together. I was more blessed, I think, than Arthur was blessed after our time together. Over cycling, over coffee, over just engaging with God, praying together, just dreaming together. And as I said goodbye to Arthur and I was going the last few kilometers home, God showed me something. God showed me this. He said the ease with which we engage with the Arthurs today will be the ease with which we engage with prime ministers, ministers, and market leaders tomorrow. Because if I can't engage with the authors today, nothing's going to supernaturally change between prison and palace. And so if I'm trusting and learning how to trust God to touch the lives of people today, it's going to be so simple for me to learn to trust God of the presidents and the prime ministers and the market leaders tomorrow. It's 
part of God's purposes for our life. So Lord, we pray that you will help us to prove ourselves faithful with little. Because Lord, as we prove ourselves faithful with little, we know that you'll be able to trust us with more. And Lord, we also pray that you will help us to overcome those feelings of being unfaithful. Because Father, we don't want the curse to follow our lives when we eventually step into that destiny. How do I know whether I'm following God or not? How do I know whether this process is part of his life? If I'm, if I'm winning at this process? Well, what happened in Joseph's life, folks? Joseph was not defined by his role. Joseph stepped into the role, embraced God, and then redefined the role around who he was and who God was. I want to encourage you. You might be in a process right now and you say, God, it sucks. It's tough. I want to encourage you to redefine that role. Don't let that role define you. Redefine it. Because in God, you can do all things. Joseph's involvement made things better. He was blessed. His master was blessed. Everything he touched was blessed because he was part of the process. If your process is being done right, there's going to be a blessing that flows out of it. Regardless of whether the man you seem to be serving is godly or not. But you being part of it is going to make things better. And finally, when the process is being done right, it will result in greater and greater responsibility. Because people are going to seek you out. People are going to want to know what you think about certain things. And they're going to want to say, because things are better with you in it, we would love to give you more and more stuff to do. Pastor Simon got a prophetic word this week. I want to share it with you. This was the word. Joseph, Joburg is one of South Africa's gateway cities. Commercially and spiritually. God is calling us to make an impact in this city. And this will have a positive influence in the nation and the nations. A gateway city is an entry point where people arrive and depart. A city where people stay for a season and move to other parts of the country or even internationally. As every nation grows back, we see ourselves as a resource center and an apostolic church. What does that mean? That means we are called to engage, establish, equip and empower leaders to go to the marketplace and to the ends of the world with the gospel of salvation and of the kingdom. You will know that we are trusting God to touch the lives of 10,000 people a week from this place on a Sunday. The reason for that is so that those 10,000 might go out and touch 100,000 people every single week. Folks, the way that we get to touch 100,000 people every single week is that by this group of us right now are going out and touching 800 people. By each one of us going and saying, God, just one thing. How do I touch the life of somebody this week? How do I impart some of you and some of your life into them? <coughs> Folks, that's how it starts. It starts with us saying, God, your process. Yes, we look up and we say, God, 10,000. But we live right here. We live with the 800 that God has given us right now in this room. And we say, Lord Jesus, have your way. And so, folks, if you're here today and you're saying, Jesus, whether your process is particularly hard right now, or whether your process is a little easier, if you say, God, I embrace your process. I embrace your process for my life. I embrace your process for this church, for this city, for this nation. If that's you and you say, God, I want to embrace that, would you stand to your feet right now? Because I want to pray that God will take us and seal his process in our lives so that we might be more effective in the future. Those that he's Father, we just come to you and we say, Lord, thank you. Lord, our desire is to focus on purpose. Day by day purpose and not ultimate destiny. Lord, our desire is that we might become more and more like you. First and foremost, Father, more and more like you. Lord, our desire is that you prepare us. That through this process you will create and position us for that end for that ultimate destiny. Together we trust in you that we will touch the lives of just one. And as each of us touches the lives of just one, Lord, we know that 800, 1,000, 2,000, and ultimately 100,000 people will be touched in us and through us every week. And so, Father, we start with what you've given us. We say, Lord Jesus, we embrace your mercy. If you're an entrepreneur, if you 
you're a market leader, if you're in some kind of position of influence, we just have a sense that we particularly want to pray God's anointing over you this morning. If that's you, and you know who you are, will you just raise your hands? Just raise both hands if that's you. Alright? Don't be embarrassed if you know who you are. Alright? You're currently in a position where God has set you apart, position of influence, position of authority. Rest of us, will we please look around, see those hands raised. Let's go and lay our hands upon them and trust God for a special anointing over their lives right now. Let's move quickly. This is body ministry, folks. Please look around. I want to make sure that everybody with their hands raised has got at least one person with their hands upon them. Lay them Father, I thank you for these people. I thank you for the entrepreneurs. I thank you for the market leaders. I thank you for those that you have raised up, Lord Jesus, and already placed in positions of authority. God, we pray for wisdom. We pray for anointing. Lord, we pray for the removal of the roadblocks that they are currently facing. We pray for a godly team of leaders, of prayer warriors around them in Jesus' name. And Father, we just pray that as they step into that destiny and continue to fulfill it, that you will go before them. And as Joshua, every place they put their foot, we pray that you'll continue to give it to them in Jesus' name. Two more things I want to pray for folks. If you're unemployed, you're trusting God for a job right now, will you just raise your hands? Because we're going to trust God. There we go. There's hands up. Hands up everywhere. Quickly raise your hands. If you're trusting God for something, again, everybody please turn around. Someone close to you, we're going to pray that God's going to provide a job right now. Amen. Father, right now, you're a God that answers prayers. Right now, Lord, we have a need to see you come through and provide a job, part of the destiny, part of the calling, Lord Jesus, part of the preparation. Father, right now we pray that you provide it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we see it. See it in faith and we receive it. Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah, Lord. Almost done, folks. Stay standing, please. If you're here today, and as I was sharing the word, you realized that there's a place of compromise that is just too loud in your life right now. Those potiphar wife situations, you're not like Joseph, able to say, absolutely no way. And you know that's because you're not right with God. Maybe you've never made a decision to follow Him. Maybe you've never made a decision to make Him your Lord and Savior. Maybe you made that decision once upon a time, but you've drifted. And now it's harder to hear God's voice, and it's so much easier just to submit and compromise. If that's you this morning, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to step out of your seat. I'd like you to be bold. I'd like you to step out of your seat, bring your possessions, bring your kind of things with you, and come down here because I would like to pray. that's you this morning, I don't want to stop the service until we've given you an opportunity to say, Jesus, I want to make right with you. There we go. Well, thank you. Thank you.
Lord, your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called you, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For the Lord is high. He regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purposes for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. And I believe it's just a declaration that the Lord makes over us and invites us that we are all to partner with Him in making this declaration. That He preserves us, He sees us, He knows us, He stretches His hand over us. That regardless of what we're going through, He preserves. for anything we're here to pray for you and to pray with you and we were feeling the word God gave us for this work series that we're doing is that God is going to give some of you a new ideas innovative ideas problem solving ideas that have never been heard of before that's the word of the Lord for you father we just want to seal this word and say God you're going to give us innovative ideas you're going to give us new ideas father god you're going to give us creative ideas father god that have never been had of in the marketplace father god and lord we're going to see the city job glorifying you lord god and will make an impact in this nation we pray this in jesus name amen god bless you see you next week Now, at the beginning of John's Gospel, there's this extraordinary introduction to who God is and how God relates with this world. We're told that the universe was brought into existence by the Logos, and the Logos was with God and then came and took flesh and came and dwelt among us. And then, as John's Gospel unfolds in chapter 1, we're pointed towards this person called Jesus of Nazareth. And we're, we're, we're kind of got this rising sense of anticipation about who this person might be. And then this person, Jesus of Nazareth, speaks for the first time in the gospel. And when he speaks, he, he asks a question. The first time he speaks in John's gospel. And here's the question. He says, what do you want? What do you want? You are here. Yeah.